Hey, thanks for tuning back in to another episode of Genuine Questions. So the main topic that I do want to talk about in this video is the Trump civil uh, rape, defamation, sexual battery trial uh, and the verdict that came out last week. But before we get into that, uh, I have had a few people like in the past week ask me if I'm left wing or right wing. It's an interesting question for me. I think most people who talk to me or watch this channel would peg me as right wing and be hard to disagree with them about that. But I do consider myself to be pretty in the middle or open minded, at least on each individual issue. Because um, there are some things about the left that I do like and agree with on like uh, policies and goals. I just don't necessarily agree that the Democratic Party is the vessel to achieve those goals, if that makes sense. But I would be cool with like a universal health care or something like that if we weren't raising our taxes in order to pay for it. If maybe we could rebudget and rework the system that we already have and not, I don't know, pay for billions of dollars for the Ukrainian war or all the other bullshit that we do pay for all the time. If we could repurpose some of our tax dollars, I think that I would be more open to hearing the arguments as opposed to being told that I'm a bad selfish person for not wanting my taxes increased and not wanting to give more money and more power and more control to a system that I think the vast majority of people agree needs reform. Before I start talking about the Trump trial, I do want to just cover like a couple of annoying conversations that I've had with people on the internet. I haven't put as much prep work into this video where I have like the screenshots of what was actually said, um, but I'm just going to kind of summarize them for you quickly. You can take my word for it that I'm not um, making up what these responses, the sentiment of it was. If you participate in online discussion, I'm sure you'll know what I'm talking about. And the first of these topics is this accusation that Republicans, conservatives, whatever, are engaging in book burning because we're not cool with having things that aren't age appropriate, sexually explicit uh, material available for minors to check out of a public school library. sort of a weird leap to make because the book on the post in question for lack of a better term I mean, it was a cartoon for like how to give a blowjob like that uh, illustrated for kids so the lady's like well this is obviously not okay but there's also a situation where at my school district there was supposed to be a field trip to the Edgar Allan Poe Museum and some mom was offended by it because his material was too dark so we had to cancel the entire field trip and that's what this type of book burning and censorship leads to. So I had, or I guess I didn't have to, but chose to explain to this woman that there is a big difference between book burning and um, putting some content restrictions on what's available in the public library. Now, first of all, regarding her example about the Edgar Allan Poe field trip, which doesn't really have anything to do with the BJ cartoon that was available to like middle schoolers, that you can go to the school board and you can make your own argument a better argument for why that field trip should be included and why Edgar Allan Poe's books should be studied in school and if you're more persuasive then you people will agree with you and then that's what the policy will be 
and you could even maybe have a compromise or come to the conclusion that for the parents who aren't comfortable with Edgar Allan Poe for whatever reason, they could sign a waiver and get back their kid assigned to an alternate, alternate assignment for the day. That seems to um, make sense and sort of be a fair solution to the totally unrelated example that you brought up. So participate in a democracy and go make a better argument than these people if you don't like what they're doing. But that's not, again, the same as book burning where you are now making these books publicly unavailable to the public. If you want your kid to go read Edgar Allan Poe and it's not taught in schools, there's nothing to stop you from going to the library or going to buy it in a bookstore where you can check it out for them and you can expose your child to the content that you're comfortable with them viewing. You don't need to rely on the public school system to teach your kids every single thing that you think is important and is reflective of your values and what you want them to know. Take some uh, initiative to go find those materials on your own. The book burning is, um, when you make it so people don't have the ability to go out and find those materials on their own. Um, haven't looked into it in a while, but I think they did something, or at least attempted to do that with the Matt Walsh's book about, like, Johnny the Walrus, where they got it removed from online retailers. So even if they, you wanted your kid to be able to or you wanted to be able to purchase that book for your kid to be able to read, you're not allowed because other people are uncomfortable with it. That would be a better example of book burning or attempted book burning as opposed to just saying like, hey, we're not going to have the How to Give a BJ for Dummies cartoon BJ book in the middle school library. If that's something that you want your kid to read, you can go buy it for him, you sick pervert, but you're free to do that. It's not publicly unavailable. It's just, um, it's the way you have to access it is with parental consent and approval. You have to go buy it for your kid. Maybe you have to go check it out of the adult section at the library if that's content you want them being exposed to, but it shouldn't be available in the school library for kids to have access to. I think that's a weird left-wing position that they have and I'm certainly glad that I have not boxed myself into the corner where I have to be the one defending why it's okay to have how to give BJ books available to kids. Gross. The other big thing that uh, the liberals were yelling at me about the past couple weeks is the phrase whataboutism. And I don't know if you're familiar with a whataboutism, but it's when somebody brings up a point or a criticism and then you reflect or come back with, well, what about this? Generally, it's then the liberals that they will scream, that's a whataboutism, that's irrelevant, I don't have to answer that. You can't answer the question without just bringing up other stuff about other people. Now, personally, I disagree. I'm not saying that a whataboutism doesn't exist, but I often feel like liberals use that as some sort of deflection to not have to address their own hypocrisy. If it truly is a whataboutism, like the liberals say, where you're bringing up just something totally unrelated to distract the point and derail the conversation, then those liberals should be able to articulate the difference between what the two examples that you have just presented to them. And oftentimes they can't, which I think is the point of the person who brings up the whataboutism, that is generally the point that they are trying to get across. At least it is when I personally use those type of arguments or ask people those question, follow-up questions in conversation. Because what I'm trying to do, what the point of asking that question is, is to point out 
their hypocrisy. For example, one of the things that I often heard about why Donald Trump was such a terrible person is because kids in cages. They were kid. He was putting kids in cages. So when you say, well, what about the fact that Barack Obama also put kids in cages and was actually, in fact, the person who built the cages to begin with? Then they'll be like, that's a whataboutism. We're not talking about Obama. We're talking about Trump. Like, and then they'll be like, you're a whataboutism. That's bringing up two unrelated things. Like, that's not unrelated things. Those are two very related things. And all I'm asking with that question is, why is one person who does it, literally Hitler, the worst person on earth, it, you are uh, beyond moral um, redemption if you like this person for this reason of kids in cages, even though the person that you are offering up as an acceptable alternative did the exact same thing. So why is it a moral crime for one and not for the other? Now, they'll try to tell you that when you're doing a whataboutism, it's unrelated. And there's actually, I believe, already a term for that logical fallacy where you bring up something unrelated to distract or derail the conversation. And I think that is called a red herring. So we don't, that's, when they try to say a whataboutism is bringing up something unrelated, then no, that is a red herring. What a whataboutism is, if used correctly, is bringing up a very related topic to ask, to point out that that person who is accusing you of being a bad person for agreeing with so-and-so or doing whatever, you're pointing out that that person is actually being a hypocrite and not holding themselves up to their same standards. The last conversation that I had that, um, I thought was pretty insightful into what's going on in current modern day society, but somebody made a post and this group would be predominantly left wing liberal women, but they made a post about Dolly Parton's upcoming album and it had the track list of all the people that she was going to be working with. And one of them was Kid Rock. So one of these ladies posted this with the thought added on that she was so disappointed in Dolly Parton for working with Kid Rock. So then I just went on to, I was in the mood and went on to comment about how it is now not even a crime or we're not even trying to ostracize people that we disagree with from society, but now we're at the point in the propaganda where we're also trying to ostracize people who associate with people that we disagree with. And obviously these women did not take kindly to the point that I was trying to illustrate. And I got several variations of, you know, it's not only the government can violate your right to free speech. So if the public doesn't like you and they choose to ostracize you, then that's just the consequences of your actions, which I understand the difference. But to deny that there is an element of social pressure, um, peer pressure that want to fit in where you, and when you do that, you are sort of taking the dirty work away from the government. That if you're willing to exact this societal pressure on people to conform with your political opinions, that there is an element to the public being able to silence people because they're going to say, well, I'm not going to speak out because... I don't want to get ostracized. I saw what happened to so-and-so when they said something. So you're putting out that message to people by doing that. And yes, it's not a technical government violation of your First Amendment right, but you have to acknowledge that when you are participating in that behavior, you are also participating in the suppression of public discourse and people's free speech. And you are de facto silencing them by sending this message out to society that if you not don't, you don't have to say those things that we don't like, but if you work with somebody, if you don't denounce the people that we don't like, then uh, you're a shame on society as well. I just, 
thought that was very interesting because, yes, this is a very small corner of the world, this Facebook group, where pretty much besides me, most of these women all agree with each other about everything. So it's not really influencing society by them personally being disappointed in Dolly Parton. But I just thought that it was interesting because, to, at least to me, it shows that people are so comfortable with this even if you want to say unintentional suppression of speech that they don't like, um, that they don't even realize that they're doing it. Like these people, these women were like, oh, we don't, we're not, silent, blah, 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 like just, it's like, no, you did. That's what this entire post is about is being disappointed in Dolly Parton for working with somebody whose political opinions you don't like. That's what you put out into the universe. I understand that your opinion is not going to have a large impact, but to me, that just the fact that you could do that and you don't even realize what you're doing shows how this mentality has sort of bled into the public subconscious, and I don't like it. So speaking of that um, topic of not being allowed to associate with people who say things that we don't like, even if nothing that you have personally said or done even agrees with that topic, I want to use that to kick off this stuff about the Donald Trump trial. Because I came across this article on the Daily Beast, where the accuser, um, Jean Carroll, her attorney, wanted one of the jurors kicked off the jury because he has listened to Tim Pool. I think that people that listen to these videos are at least familiar with who Tim Pool is. He used to be a pretty left-wing commentator, and then I think, like myself, just saw a lot of this hypocrisy and unfairness that unfolded during the Trump administration, and he just started reporting on it. Um, I don't listen to him enough to know how he personally feels about things anymore, like where he lands on the issues now, but I, like, I think he covers topics in a fair way. And I don't know why listening to Tim Pool would make somebody ineligible to be on the jury. But they, her attorneys called, that he said he was very extremist podcast. And obviously if we had known this at the point of jury selection, we would have never allowed him on the jury. So if Tim Pool is so divisive, that just by nature of listening to him, people just can't be fair anymore. I don't know. That's ridiculous to me that that fortunately the judge disagreed with the uh, arguments being made by the woman's attorneys. Because, uh, yeah, the judge let him stay on the jury. But just the fact that that's even an opinion that you are comfortable professionally voicing in front of a judge, like, on the record, that Tim Pool is an extremist podcast, and just even the fact that you listen to him makes you an unfair person who's not qualified to be on the jury is astounding to me that we're at the point where people aren't up in arms that somebody would go that far with it. I want to talk about the actual accusations and this guilty verdict because when I heard that Trump was having a civil trial, I did not realize that this was the woman who they deemed credible enough to take this in front of a jury. But this is the lady who says that Donald Trump raped her in the uh, Bergdorf's dressing room, which is a Manhattan department store that apparently they were all alone in in the middle of the day. And she gave an interview to Anderson Cooper about it on CNN, which is crazy. And I have it, and I'm going to show it to you. Because if you actually go and look at CNN's channel and try to find this interview, they cut off the end where it really goes off the rails. But fortunately, I have saved the copy of the unedited version where you can truly see what a nut job this lady is. And I definitely remember in my lifetime where you were supposed to believe all women, um, or believe women. I've heard both. 
I know now they are trying to rewrite that history and pretend that they never said that and that what they really said and meant was that you were just supposed to listen to people and determine if their stories were credible that way. So, again, I definitely do not remember that being the catchphrase at the time, but I'll roll with it and we'll just listen to what this woman says, see if she's credible, and judge for ourselves. Because I do think... I do think that is the right way to do it, that you should judge every situation on its individual merits, and I cannot believe that anybody is taking this woman seriously. Let's talk about what, what you say happened, because uh, obviously the, the details of it all matter. In, you say you were in Bergdorf Goodman. I was coming out of Bergdorf's. Which was, was a store I heard you liked a lot. It's a posh and cozy. Your and whole just, face lights up when you talk about Bergdorf. I, just, by the way. I was just there today. Okay. It just, I just loved it. So I was coming out, and he was coming in. He was standing out, and he put his hand like this. So I did not go through the revolving door. He came in. He said, hey, you're that advice lady. And I said, hey, you're that real estate tycoon. He said, come advise me. I want to buy a present. I said, oh, for who? He said, for a girl. So I was enchanted. It was such a great moment. Uh -huh. So how about the handbags? Oh no, he doesn't want a handbag. Well, how about a hat? So he strolls to that. He and had you, you hadn't, had you met him prior once, to that? Just once, briefly. Okay. There's a picture. Yeah, that's where the, the photo of with, yes. with, a, uh, with my ex-husband ex and he with his right. ex-wife, um, a very, Nice. It's a very nice. Which, story. by the way, he had said he, he's never even met you previously. Obviously, the picture which we have, uh, you know, tells a different story. So, I just want to pause there to say that that's bullshit to be like, oh, he obviously lied about knowing who you are because we found this picture of you where you got to, like, meet him at a gala or some sort of celebrity event and got your picture taken hold, shaking his hand. Um, that's not, I don't think that that's some smoking gun to show that Trump knows exactly who she is. I'm sure there's a lot of people he shakes hands with and meets in passing like that, that that's not the uh, slam dunk piece of evidence that Anderson Cooper is trying to imply there. Uh, we went to the hats and he immediately put a, grabbed a fur hat, of course, and I said, oh, you can't put a dead animal on your head. And then I found out later, of course, all of his women wear those fur hats, mm. Ivana, Ivanka, they, have you, you've seen mm. pictures, they all wear, okay. So um, he asked, I said, how old is the young lady? And he said, how old are you? And I said, 52. And he said, you're so old. He said that? Of course. He said, you're so old. And shortly after that, he said, I know, lingerie, or he could have said underwear. And so we went up the escalator, we went to the lingerie department. It was empty. There was nobody there. There was nobody on the whole floor, frankly. Um, I think you go through bathing suits and cruise wear. And this, the store was not popular at the time. Nobody was there on the counter. It, that's going to sound strange, people, that nobody was in the... Because store. Bergdorf's is the greatest store on the earth. They take care of whatever you want there, there. Mm -hmm. If you're thirsty, they'll bring you water, they'll get you whatever, they'll call all over the country to get whatever you want. That's another thing that she says right there that just doesn't make sense. Because to Anderson Cooper's point and common sense, that makes... It seems impossible that in the middle of a Manhattan department store, they are the only two people there. There's not an employee around. There's not another customer, not a security guard, nothing. And when he asks her about that, she explains it away by saying, because they're the best store ever and like their staff's always going to take care of you and bring you water if you're thirsty. It's, to me, that paints the picture that you have like a personal shopper who's up your ass from the moment that you walk into that store. Um, I've heard of department store workers, get, especially back like in the 90s and stuff, getting paid commission. So I would imagine if Donald Trump was there shopping for anything, but like lingerie, maybe somebody that worked there who was going to get a commission based off of what they were going to sell him, would be swarming around trying to offer a drink, trying to help these people with their shopping because apparently she was a, a vice lady celebrity too even though i have absolutely no idea what she's talking about there so her expl explanation for that obvious hole in her story 
doesn't do anything to clear it up or make it make sense. If anything, it makes it less plausible that she's telling the truth because if they're taking care of you, you're every want, every need, they actually have to talk to you and interact with you to find out what your wants and needs are. It was a moment in time nobody was there. Uh, plus, a dressing room door was open, which is very unusual because usually they're locked mm -hmm. and the uh, tenant comes and locks it, escorts you in, it's uh, okay. So on the uh, So counter, he said lingerie because he wanted, he said he wanted you to help him pick out some lingerie. Well, he, it can't because he was not having it with the hats. Okay. The hats were, okay. So then we went up, he was gonna get some lingerie and I am just like, oh, well, I can dine out forever on this story, we're gonna go get lingerie. You go, you say you go up to the, the, the lingerie department and no one is around. And there are two or three boxes on the counter, the fancy, remember the old fashioned lingerie boxes, and a filmy see-through bodysuit in lilac gray. And he snatches it up and he says, go try this on. I said, you try it on. He said, no, it looks like it fits you. I said, it goes with your eyes. He said, no, go put this on. And Anderson, so at this point, it's you're saying it's uh, a friendly joshing. joshing. I used to be a writer at Saturday Night Live. I see an entire sketch of making Donald Trump put this filmy thing over his pants. That is what I'm thinking. Mm. I am not thinking. I think it's. I just. I was laughing as I said it. He said, "Well, you know." He went like this, and I walked in. Stupidly. So for you, this was kind of a, a New York moment. Like oh, one of the those best things. New York. Just uh. like the best New York. Donald Trump is going to put on a filmy bodysuit? Mm. It's like, oh, I couldn't. So he, let's go in the dressing room. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to make him put the pants on. Walked in, and the minute I was in there, he shut the door and pushed me up against the wall and bang, bang my head on the wall and kissed me. I just, it was so shocking. I couldn't. Of course, I started laughing again um, because... You started laughing? Of course. What, what, why? What, why, of course? Because it was a way of... If it was at all erotic in his part, it would, if a man is laughed at, it usually will make him... Uh, um, um, and he put his shoulder against me to hold me against the wall. And at that point, I realized that I was in a very difficult situation. Did he say anything? No, no, it was just like, we're going to do this thing. We're just so hot for each other. Uh, or wh I don't, wh why would I even try to think what he was thinking? Anyway, so he pushed me, you know, he pushed me, held me with his shoulder, and I was wearing a, a coat dress and tights, and he pulled down the tights. And so um, that's he pulled what... With, with, he pulled it with both hands, with one hand? One. He and um, that was when it turned serious. I realized that this was, this was, this was a fight. Um, and even though I can talk about it now uh, and put words to it, at the time the adrenaline is pouring through me and all I want to do is, right. How would you describe, what were you, you, you said you were, you were obviously fighting. surprised, fighting. Right. Were you scared? Were you no, angry? No, you... I was too panicked to be scared. Too panicked to be scared, okay. You know, uh, it, you said adrenaline was pumping. I assume it was yeah. because I got strong enough. He's 6'3, apparently, I've looked it up. I was about 6'1 in the massive heels I was wearing. And so we were even, almost even in height. And down go the tights. And it was against my will. And it hurt, and it was a fight. And this is not a question I would normally ask, and if, if you don't want to answer, I totally understand. Um, but given the prior accusations, which have all been of forms of assault or harassment, um, you, you're saying there was actual penetration? Yes. Did you... Part of what I looked up, trying to figure out like the details of Trump's guilty verdict, or I guess since it was a civil case, like liable for sexual battery and defamation. I have a whole list of genuine questions that I want to talk about at the end of this video, but I want to pause it right here and discuss 
one of them. Because according to what I read, that there were three, three women. I don't know if that means three, including this nut job right here, or if we have her and then three additional women. I think uh, it's two additional women, though, actually. I don't have the particular notes for that. But they were allowed to come in and testify to their accusations about Donald Trump. And both of their accusations didn't come out until also after Trump was a political candidate. So it's not like this establishes this long-running history of these allegations that went nowhere. People heard about the allegations for the first time. Not when he was a star of The Apprentice. Not when he was this huge famous figure on television. It didn't have a problem with it then. They only decided to come forward when he was president. So apparently they were too scared of his power when he was the host of The Apprentice. But suddenly when he becomes the leader of the free world, they're not so scared anymore. I don't understand how you're allowed to bring those people in. Because it reminded me of the Bill Cosby trial where his conviction actually got overturned. And part of the reason that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned it is because they violated this principle of or this rule where you're not allowed to bring in prior bad acts as evidence because it's prejudicial. So if you are charging somebody with robbery you can't bring up the fact that they've been convicted of robbery um, you know, two times in the past to establish this pattern. Because the rule is that's unfairly prejudiced to the jury that you have to be able to focus on the, the proving that they committed the crime this time for which they are standing trial for. And you can't just be like, well, they did bad stuff in the past, so that means that they definitely did it this time. That's just a court of law evidentiary rule and there are exceptions to it but the exceptions would be if they're like very similar cases so establishing a pattern which this lady just says right here to Anderson Cooper that that she's not following the pattern the other women talked about like maybe some inappropriate touching or sexual harassment comments or whatever but she is the only one full-on saying rape penetration so you can't bring in these other people to say that Trump's been a creep to them in the past to try to justify the fact that he now raped this woman you have to bring evidence about what this woman is saying and I don't know why that if it that's the basis that it was overturned in the Cosby trial that they let the like six other women talk about their accusations even though they never pressed charges and then it gets overturned by the Supreme Court I would think that same principle applies to this case because I don't think that unless these women are all saying that yeah Donald Trump hung around Burdorf's dressing room and had a deal with the people that work there that he would like pay him off to disappear and close the floor down so he could rape women in the dressing room then yeah it's relevant and you're establishing this like pattern this uh, MO that they have but they're just bringing in other people to sort of talk about creepy adjacent behavior to try to prove that he raped this woman. And I don't think that you should be allowed to do that. I think that is incredibly unfair. And I hope that just like the Cosby verdict, this one would get overturned as well on an appeal. But we'll see how it goes. Uh, I have a feeling that's not going to work out the way that I think it should. Which is puts it into a different category of any of these other any of the other uh, women who have come forward. Um, I think techno, I mean, that, that, is, that is the definition of, of rape, one definition. That's the definition, yes. Do, how long? Brief, mm -hmm. brief, because when a woman is stamping her feet. That's, and that's what you were doing, you started stamping yeah. your feet. I always think back and think, I, that was the stupidest thing I've ever done. I should have never have done it. And then I didn't behave. I, when you say I should have never done it, you mean? That was just a dumb thing to go into a dressing room with a man that I hardly know mm. and have him shut the door and then be unable to stop him. And um, I was a competitive athlete. 
So I wasn't like a, I didn't freeze. I, I rose to the occasion and um, it did not last long. And that's why I don't use the word you just use. I use the word fight. You don't use the word rape. Sexual violence is in every country, in every strata of, of society. And I just feel that so many women are undergoing sexual violence. Mine was short. I got out. I'm happy now. I'm uh, moving on. Um, and I think of all the women who are enduring constant sexual violence. So this one instant, this one, what, three minutes in this little dressing room, I just say it's the fight. That way I'm not the victim. What I would be curious to hear her answer some questions about, and to my, to my knowledge, this didn't uh, come up in the trial, if anybody has access to this bit of testimony where she addresses this, please send it to me. I'm deathly curious. But how did this uh, rape end? Because she said it's like three minutes long, there's nobody around, nobody, did somebody come to help her? Did just the fact that she stamped her feet make him stop because I I don't she doesn't ever to my knowledge explain how this interaction ended and I think that's kind of a key important point of the story because she says that she laughed at him like he kind of came in with the attitude like oh, we have to have each other now we're so hot for each other and she laughed at him to try to deter him and then that's what threw him into the violent rage so if that's like what gets him hard and going is that she's fighting and he's in this violent rage, I don't understand really like how her stamping her feet is then he suddenly decided to back off. Is it like she was stamping her feet and then that's when he realized like, oh, she doesn't want this and he backed off because then that doesn't jive with her earlier part in the story where he launched into this violent attack once she laughed at him. If he was willing to back off once he realized she didn't want it, then why did he attack her in the first place? And if he wasn't willing to back off once she realized why she didn't want it, that she didn't want it, then how did this altercation end? Right? I'm not the victim. You don't feel like a victim? I was not thrown on the ground and ravished. Which, the word rape carries so many sexual connotations. This was not... This was not sexual. For it just it it hurt. It just what it just you know. Well, I think most people think of rape as a. I mean, it is a violent assault. It is not. I a think sexual. most people think of rape as being sexy. Mm. Let's take a short break. Think of the fantasies. Mm. We're just going to take a quick break. If you can stick around, we'll talk more on the other side. You're fascinating to talk to. <laughs> So, yeah, she, that's the part of the interview that CNN cuts out is there at the end when she talks about how rape is sexy and, you know, think of the fantasies. And I just love Anderson Cooper's, like, and we'll, we'll go to commercial break now. Like, ooh, he knew that, he knew it was over as soon as she said that. So, I thought after she said all of that, that they buried her in the, you know, uh, trash dump with Blasey Ford and all the other uh, people that they reject the second that they're not politically convenient for them to have the spotlight on anymore. So I was quite surprised when I found out that it was her allegations that are the ones they took in front of the judge. But the other thing that I just don't understand, and this I guess isn't so much about like Trump, but more the legal system. So if there's anybody that knows the answer to this question, I don't understand it but one of the things tr so Trump was found not liable for raping her but was found liable for like sexual battery which I looked up that and that basically means like unwanted physical contact touching but stopping short of penetration which would be and then he was also found guilty of defamation for, or liable for defamation for saying that this woman made up her allegations. Now, as you just heard in that interview, she's very clear on the fact that there was penetration, that she was raped. If she writes in her book that he raped her and Trump says, no, I didn't, you're a liar, 
And then the civil jury says that he didn't rape her. I don't understand how they can find him then guilty of defamation. Because she said they raped her. He said, no, I didn't. How did he defame her by saying that she's a liar if he didn't do what she said? Doesn't make sense to me. So I don't, are people not allowed to respond when somebody makes an allegation about them that they don't think is true? You're not allowed to say, no, that didn't happen because the civil jury also didn't find that it happened either. So it's not like there was this overwhelming amount of proof and he was calling her a liar. The jury didn't even figure out that, find that it happened. So how could, how legally could he be responsible for defaming her for denying the allegations? It just, that and the fact that their entire, um, case against him is these two other women that also said he was a creep and then they played the bits of the access hollywood tape where again that has nothing to do with what she is accusing him of if you listen to the access hollywood tape he is talking about taking advantage of gold diggers and he does talk about making a move on a married woman but he even says that when she is like "Mm," he backs off there's nothing in that tape that he is talking about raping people. He's talking about people who will let you take advantage of them sometimes because you're a celebrity and they think that there's something that they might get out of it. And then he's also talking about a time where he hit on a married woman and she rejected him. And then he doesn't go on to brag about raping her afterwards. It seems like he accepts the rejection and is making, you know, making fun of himself and everything about it with his friends over at Access Hollywood. So, I do, I do, other than a corrupt legal system, I don't understand how any of that stuff would be allowed in court to convict this person of the crime of raping this woman in the bird doors dressing room in the middle of the day in Manhattan. I just, none of the evidence that they provided has anything to do with it. They just basically had a trial where they talked about all the individual times, independent of each other, that people have accused Donald Trump of being a creep, and then want you to draw the conclusion that because of all this other stuff that we've said, that must mean that this woman's telling the truth too. Even though there's no evidence to suggest that she is, she can't even remember what year it happened in, which is very convenient for her, because then Donald Trump can never provide an alibi, because if he's like, well, I wasn't even in Manhattan on that day, here's my flight records or whatever to show that I was doing whatever, and then she'd be like, well, I, I was obviously wrong about the day then. So, I, how you can go forward with this, and how people who don't like Donald Trump feel good about this, and they're like, yeah, we finally got him, like, justice has been served. I, I don't care about, like, being... That to me, this transcends how you feel about left wing versus right wing policy issues and healthcare and all of that. This is a scary uh, bit of not even bit like huge thing with this hypocrisy in our criminal justice system, and obviously the people that are running it are very corrupt people who I don't think we can trust to do any of the other things that they are pretending that they're going to do for the people because they're these caring, like, hardworking politicians. So I think in order to get to the point where we can change some of those policies to maybe make things better and more fair for everybody, we need to get rid of the cancer in government, which is the people running it who are very corrupt. So we need to quit voting for the establishment and the people that have been in office for 60 years and trust those people to dismantle the system that they've been working to create this whole entire time. And I don't get how people don't see the hypocrisy, how they are not scared at the weapon weaponization of the justice system, because again, to me, that's just a little more important when we're dealing with people who have the ability to falsely accuse and fine or lock up people who stand in the way of whatever their agenda is. I can't really get to caring that much about what the agenda is until, because I see how they enforce it and the ends don't justify the means. 